Hello everyone, welcome to the NZX webinar for this week. I'm super excited to bring you Spring Sheep. Um, they are people who I adore. I've kind of weirdly stalked them in the background since the inception of the company. And, um, and, and I feel quite strongly, quite passionate about um, how they do things, um, how they operate, and, and I'm loving seeing the growth. Uh, just before we get started though, do ask questions during the session so you can drop those into the uh, chat box or the question box. And also, uh, if you are having trouble with audio, try your volume, um, you know, try all you can with your computer if that fails, just jump onto your phone. We found that the phones are often the best way if you're having problems with your laptops to um, engage on to the system. So look, without further ado, we've got Scotty Chapman and Nick Hammond here. Scotty's the CEO and Nick Hammond is the COO. And look, do, do one of you just want to kind of talk us through what is Spreadsheet? Yeah, sure. So Spring Sheep is a collaboration between Palmu and SLC, which is a group of New Zealand agri-investors. And what we've done is set up a sheep milking platform in New Zealand so we can take the goodness of sheep milk to the world. Awesome. And, you know, like I was talking beforehand to Nick and I was just sort of saying, how crazy does it feel to have had a vision turn into a reality? Yeah, I mean, in many ways it feels new, but if you look at it, sheep milking has been happening around the world for millennia. So it's new for New Zealand, but if you look at our combination of one being very good as a dairy country and one very good as a sheep, it's just a natural evolution that we got to eventually. Awesome. Now, look, did you want to talk us through a little bit about your products or, or you know, what? give us a bit of an overview there? Yeah, if it's okay with you, we thought we'd start with just a dozen slides to set the scene and give a bit of an idea on who we are, start with a video to get a, a rough idea on what sheep milking actually is, and then happy to take questions as we go or at the end. Awesome. Let's rip into it. Is that us? Yes. Okay. So we'll just start with a quick 30 second video so um, everyone can get a feel of what sheep milking actually is like on the ground. So as you can see, it's just very much a high value dairy dairy play, very similar to bovine, except that it's you know more nutritious, less um, less issues around environmental and less issues around digestibility. So just as a bit of a start, where we got to, how we got here in the first place, it was originally a collaboration between Palmu, as I mentioned, and SLC, group of agri investors, and we decided to do an end-to-end -end sheep milk venture in New Zealand, um, from farming right through to branding. In a year or two later, MPI came through, and due to the um, support of them with the Primary Growth Partnership, we've been able to try a whole lot of different things that a normal company wouldn't necessarily be able to. And that's allowed us to fast track this from a small business into something now that will become an industry for New Zealand. Everything we do is about consumer driven. So when you look at New Zealand agribusiness over the years, even our most successful businesses make up, you know, Zespri, wine, um, Apple, anything you like. We seem to go through a valley of death where we become supply pushed, we get really good, we get bigger and bigger, and then we crash it. And we have the luxury here of a greenfields business where we can set it up how we want. So everything we do is around how we can provide what the consumer wants. By getting it right with the consumer and creating demand, we can backfill supply. And as long as we keep that mindset where demand is everything and we backfill supply once we have that demand, we know we can create an industry for New Zealand without that valley of death created by an oversupply on the way through. And in regards to what consumers are looking for, there's five real mega trends in global demand at the moment. You know, that's around health and wellness, evolving protein, digestibility, 
premiumisation and provenance. And sheep milking out of New Zealand has hit this sweet spot perfectly. So we are in a really strong position to be able to supply what is being required by the consumer right now, as long as we set it up correctly. So that's, um, that's an overview of what we can supply consumers. In regards to what we supply, when Spring Sheep began, you know, we, we said we're a dairy company, etc. But very quickly we worked out we're a nutritional company because when you have the world's most precious milk, you should be dealing with the world's most precious consumer. So now we make a range of probiotics, a range of different family family milk as well. But the real products we're driving now is infant formula because as a sole source of nutrition, with its um, with its benefits, and we'll go into those in a minute, it really is made for this. So it's a new super premium offering that we can provide to the world's most discerning consumers. Um, yeah, sorry, just the button, but we've just sure. got a question here. What makes it more nutritional sure. than cow's milk? So there's nutrition and there's digestibility. So probably digestibility is the easiest one to play on on that. Nick will talk about the clinical in regards to that in the next slide. But um, from a digestibility perspective, it's much, much easier for consumers to digest than cow's milk is. And we've been doing clinical work on that, which Nick will talk about in a minute. OK, cool. Thank you. You know, it's, it's a good question. Um, and it's one that we identified quite early in our journey uh, when we dug in to understand what the consumer proposition is, uh, was for sheep milk. And what we found consistently was that mothers, uh, particularly with children below the age of eight, uh, found that digestion was one of the main concerns they had uh, when they're feeding their children dairy. What we also found is uh, when Scotty and I began this journey, a huge amount of anecdotal uh, discussion around people who are finding they could actually drink sheep's milk despite having uh, challenges with other milks. Uh, we've since, over the last sort of few years, we've done more and more research in this space. Um, we've done a bit of uh, uh, lab-based trials and a few things like that, but the real key one was completed quite recently where we did a full human clinical trial uh, comparing the digestibility of sheep milk to cow milk. And this was done at uh, all the full clinical levels. Um, it was done by Liggins and Auckland University uh, with Ag Research. And we basically took uh, 30 consumers who had issues with digesting cow's milk and did a um, double-blinded study against um, sheep's milk. And the real key thing that came out of that was that the sheep's milk protein was more readily digested and its fats were more easily converted into energy compared to cow's milk. Now, this is a really key one for us because while there's a very good existing sort of latent consumer understanding around the benefits of sheep milk and the markets we go into, that's really validated from a scientific perspective. And what we're seeing um, more frequently these days is consumers need to uh, believe in initial narrative, but they also need to see the science to back it up. So this is a really big thing for the industry to actually prove this at a scientific level. Awesome. Yep. So, um, and, and will we're you going continue to talk about those trials on, Nick? What's that, sorry? Will you continue on with these with clinical trials just to make sure that you're keeping up with? Absolutely. I think for this, this is really what we consider sort of an establishment um, clinical trial. It was done with a relatively small cohort of 30. Uh, what we'll look to do over the, um, over the coming years is deeper and deeper research into this area. Um, our head of R&D at Spring Sheep is doing a, um, a PhD in this space, so we're seeing a lot more information coming through that, and we'll probably look to double down um, in these sort of clinical trial areas as well, and possibly at higher scale. Awesome. So um, we're going to move on to the sort of the scaling um, farming processing pieces. Any particular questions you'd like to run through before we go into that space of the business? Um, we've well, just one here is what were the two key challenges to get? customer acceptance of a new product product and delivering that and you've given you've talked about the clinical trials but were there other things you needed to do to kind of get that consumer interest first yeah sure so from a customer um, acceptance perspective where we began um, and we've matured since then but we used to call it on on the goat tails so goat already created a category for those who were having digestive issues around cow and had created on the shelf a spot for alternative dairy. Um, A2 opened it up, Goat made it bigger, and, and it's getting larger and larger. And that is the fastest growing dairy category we believe there is at the moment. So Goat had opened it up. We are now the better tasting goat, if you like. There's another option here whereby there is an option. You've got a New Zealand story. You've got everything that Nick just talked about. So the shelf is there. They are looking for alternative dairy. And the growth in Goat is massive. It's hard to fill. And sheep is a premium product that comes over that again. So we have a super premium option to go into what is already a premiumizing category. So it hasn't been as hard as we imagined. For Kiwis, sheep milk sounds weird and wonderful, but for our consumers in Asia who are already very used to goat milk, it's not a very big step. Right. And look, who are your main international competitors? 
Um, it's a, probably the, the GOAT players at the moment, as I mentioned. At the moment, there is a lot of shelf space available, so it's not hard to get in. But, I mean, you yeah. could call Danone a competitor because they've just gone into sheep. I don't. I think it's fantastic. It's great that these big multinationals see an opportunity for New Zealand sheep milk. So Danone are on shelf, but that's not a competitor. That's just a really good thing for the industry. And then there's all the GOAT players around the world, which you know, which are also growing share off bovine though. So we're still in a beautiful situation whereby it's a growing category looking for product. So it's not like we're really having to shut anyone else down to make this do it. And I think it's important to understand the contents of, context of the scale uh, globally in this industry. I think when I talk to New Zealanders, they um, often try and frame us as more of a niche industry and it's not really the, not necessarily the case. Uh, and a lot of the really big dairy producing countries actually have multi-billion dollar sheep milking industries alongside uh, with millions of dairy sheep. So these are really serious and large industries um, in every, almost every other major dairy uh, country in the world. So as Scotty said, mentioned at the beginning, it's just a, it's an absolute tragedy that a country that has such strong dairy processing capability and is so good at animal husbandry around sheep, that we don't already have a major industry in this space. Mm. But in terms of the context of growing a really big industry for New Zealand here, it's a very genuine one. There's already very large proven uh, business cases for that and for making a billion dollar industry in this space. And would you classify it as, a, as complementary to what we're already doing? Absolutely. I mean, bovine is a fantastic product. It's created categories in the last 50 years in Asia that's been brilliant for New Zealand through the nutritionals. Goats come and complemented that again. And once again, sheep can complement this because we can bring people into the dairy space that currently are shut out of dairy due to allergies and things. So there is a great way for New Zealand to increase its dairy footprint through a different species. And that's great for us and great for New Zealand as a whole. And it really leverages a lot of strengths we already have. Um, you know, we've got amazing processing uh, capability in both an equipment perspective, but also people. Uh, we have a fantastic reputation globally for high quality dairy. Uh, and we've got fantastic stories around provenance, which we can leverage. And as Scotty's alluded to, we're not in a position where we're actually taking cow dairy uh, customers away. We're actually bringing customers back into dairy that have already left it. And that's the yeah. same at the farming level, which we'll touch on shortly. We're actually creating opportunities for farmers to do things that they might not be able to do. Uh, going forwards. Cool. Sorry, I feel like I keep stopping you, but if you want to go into the farming, I've got a. There's a few farming questions popping up, but if you go through it, and then I'll see if you answer them. Okay. Fantastic. So the next real conversation um, is really around how do we actually scale a New Zealand industry, and so I'm just going to work our way through the supply chain on that. Uh, interestingly enough, um, in a country full of uh, dairy processing capability and sites, uh, it was really actually hard to uh, get the dairy processing element off the ground. Uh, the reason is that most of the New Zealand dairy processing capability is incredibly large. And so what we needed to do was actually have a smaller processing site to begin. And we started off using a, um, a site called D1 at Food Innovation Waikato, uh, which is a half tonne spray dryer, so incredibly small in the context of, of New Zealand dairy. What this did do though is it gave us a stepping stone to get off the ground. Um, we had a few thousand sheep to begin with, and that was, was really only using um, a small part of that spray dryer. We've now gone through quite a, um, a quite a steady growth curve over the last five years. Uh, Net dry has now been expanded, so uh, they've recently um, built and are about to fi finalise commissioning on a 1.2 ton uh, spray dry, so significantly bigger than our starting one. Again, in, um, based in based in Hamilton, and so these are the two sites in the site in the slide here, um, right next to each other. And what this is enabling is the sheep milking industry to go through those iterations of scale. So we started off with a pilot spray dryer aligned to our sort of pilot farming mode. We're now going into a more of a scaling up spray dryer and in the future we'll be able to utilise the existing capability there is um, and processing uh, capacity in the, in the cow dairy industry. But this has been a little bit of a constraint for the regional expansion of the industry. Uh, these are both based in the Waikato. Uh, we uh, genuinely get a, we get a phone call or an email from someone outside of that um, Waikato catchment uh, almost every week now saying when can you pick up my milk and can you send a tanker to Christchurch? Uh, we'd love to but um, it's just it's not something we can do at the moment. So. I think there's going to be an ongoing question around um, regional expansion in the sheep milking industry and how that ties into the processing requirements. Um, might Sorry, be a dumb question, but um, with processing, can you just convert dairy cow processing to to sheep, or is there is it quite a different process? Um, for the most part, they're pretty similar. Um, sheep milk has uh, significantly higher solids than cow's milk, so that requires a couple uh, minor adjustments, but the spray dryers we use um, can also run uh, uh, goat and cow and um, anything else similar. So uh, fundamentally, there's no major constraint there. Cool. So, so onto the farming piece, which New Zealanders always love to dig into. Um, 
So we've really been in this interesting sort of position where we where we needed to create a, a scalable farming model for New Zealand uh, for for dairy sheep, and there were three really sort of driving perspectives we had when we were looking at creating that model. Uh, the first one was the environmental impact. Uh, we did some initial studies in the early stages of spring sheep, which showed there was potential to reduce the nitrogen leaching um, underneath the sheep milking model versus a cow dairy one. And this is one we've sort of done a bit more research on over the last uh, few years, and there's a very real opportunity in here. We've seen a few of the new suppliers have come on, have come on mainly because they um, see that there's a much more sustainable model here from an environmental perspective, and particularly with, uh, and particularly in areas where there's more sensitive land or where there's creeping regulations. So we're seeing this as being an interesting um, and, and sort of major driving factor for some farmers looking to diversify into sheep milking. Uh, the, other, the other one is uh, obviously social. Uh, we need to make sure we actually create models that are sustainable um, for people. And this has been, we often get the question of why don't you guys do year-round milking? Um, that's largely driven by the social implications. We actually like it that we follow the New Zealand grass curve and that our farmers get a bit of, a bit of time to recharge uh, between seasons. So uh, then there's a few other elements in terms of our model, particularly around health and safety, uh, where we can really um, get that social piece right. We find farmers actually just um, who have come over to sheep absolutely just love working with them as animals. Uh, if you get kicked by one, you get a little scratch rather than a concussion. Um, they're very clean. People always ask us how frequently we're cleaning out our parlours, and they're actually incredibly clean animals uh, in the parlour, and just really nice animals to work with on a on regular basis. And it's often a surprise to people who've worked with um, uh, worked with sheep by themselves. The idea of getting them to go into a parlour is just um, it's hard for them to get their heads around. They actually need to see it to believe it. But um, they're amazing uh, from a milking perspective. They come and they line up in their perfect little row and uh, drop their milk and, and they're off. They're, they're a really cool animal to work with. Uh, at I an mean, economic level, um, sorry, go for it. I oh no, I was just going to say that um, I did weasel into milk at one of your farms and um, it was probably such a cool experience. They were actually so calm. They, I think there was two ewes that kept running off and then just coming back in, like they'd come reverse back in to get the little <laughs> nut that they got. It was, it was actually more entertaining than anything. I kind of kept missing bits because I was too busy watching the what the sheep were doing, but it was it was incredibly clean. It was incredibly calm. It was um, it was a pretty cool experience. I think if you were having a bad day, it's the thing to go do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and and that's a big thing for us in terms of our in our own team and culture. We always talk about Susan, who's uh, our lead sheep, and we often say, "What would Susan say about this?" So when we're looking at farming practices, we often take that um that animal uh, animal welfare lens. And um, how she perceived that. And I, I remember in the early days of sheep milking, I said to um, to John Ryrie, who's this amazing farmer we brought into New Zealand uh, to teach us how to do this. I said, "Well, can we um, can we split the flock up into two and have you know halfway through a season we want to have this flock here and this flock here because it looks great on a spreadsheet?" And he goes, "No, Nick, you can't do that because um, they'll drop their milk." And I said, "Oh, why would they do that?" And go, "Well, you're going to break up all their social structures. So they've all they've already got really established social structures, and as soon as you draw a line down those." Uh, they'll start dropping out of milk uh, because they're an incredibly social creature. And so just widening that sort of perspective about the animal, the animal's perspective in a farming model has been a really big part of our journey at Spring Sheep. And so the farmers we choose to work with really need to buy into that. They need to believe um, in the, the vital importance of uh, animal welfare, um, not just from a social license to operate perspective, which is a commercial lens, but really in terms of who they are and, and getting the most out of, out of their animals, because healthy animals are always going to outperform uh, ones that aren't being treated well. Uh, the other key area um, is, is the economic one. So the real challenge with sheep milking and why we don't already have a really good industry in New Zealand is that the economic model just hasn't really stacked up. Uh, the main driver for that is that we just haven't had enough milk volume per sheep. And so if you look at the actual model, to reach a sustainable sort of level economically, you need to be getting around 250 litres per sheep uh, per season. Uh, what we've seen uh, when we sort of began this journey was the majority of the commercial flocks were sort of around that 120 litres. And a normal sheep is going to get you around 70 litres. So the real constraint for the industry was actually in um, proving that economic model, which was driven by a lack of milk per sheep. Uh, because the costs of running a low-performing sheep aren't that different to a high-performing one. So economically, where we're at today is, um, as, as a flock average last season, we're around that 250 litre mark, uh, which has actually put us uh, on par economically uh, as an alternative land use to cow um, within the Waikato. And the really great thing is we've actually got a lot of scope to grow that. So where we're looking long term is going to be well into the 300 litre plus and close to 400 litres. Our, um, our top sheep were, were actually just over around, around 550 litres this season. 
and I'll come to that next, but that's, um, that's been a big part of our breeding journey. But economically where we're at now is, um, is actually, we've actually got a very proven model. And one of the things we wanted to do though, was actually show farmers that. So it's one thing to sit down and go through a spreadsheet, but New Zealand farmers actually need to go and engage with the model and see it for themselves. So one of the real big things we did through our um, primary growth partnership program was look at establishing pilot farms. And we've done, we've done three different pilot farms, each exploring a different model. Uh, the first one in Telfari uh, is what we call an outdoor model. This is one we see a lot of farmers picking up going forwards. Essentially what we did here was we took a, a effectively a failed cow dairy farm uh, that had all the infrastructure left over um, from a cow dairy farm that wasn't being used. Uh, it, it was just being used for grazing. And we converted that over to sheep milking for not a large amount of capital. Um, this was a very old cow dairy farm and it cost us a few hundred K to do this. Um, more modern uh, cow dairy farms, were, maybe they're already being used at the moment, only a couple hundred K to convert over. And we're able to convert over to a fully outdoor model for a couple hundred K. Uh, we reduced the environmental impact, significantly increased the revenue, and we've made it a, um, a financially viable model. So we see a lot of farmers who are on these, particularly these smaller sites, these 50 odd, 50 to 70 hectare sites, or they're under a bit more environmental pressure, looking at this as a really interesting model to stay in dairying, to stay using their fundamental skill sets around looking after animals and producing um, beautiful milk. The other model is what we call the hybrid model. Uh, so under this model, we've, um, we've got some indoor shelter, so we, but we, we don't use it uh, consistently. It's only used during very cold parts of winter and in the heat of summer. And even then it's only used during certain parts of the day. Uh, this model is actually really good for different um, for a different sort of group of farmers, um, ones who might want to use a bit more silage in their, uh, in their feed regimes or have different land, uh, and particularly land in more sensitive areas. So by having that indoor element, you're able to reduce the environmental impact even further. Uh, it's also very good for super high performance sheep. So in the outdoor model, we've selected sheep that are a little bit hardier. In the hybrid model, you can go for the super performance ones. So it's a different model again, obviously higher in capital, uh, but has different advantages to it. And the last one um, is a really large scale model. So this one has around, uh, the other two have about 800 dairy sheep. Uh, the large scale model has a couple of thousand. And this is one that's based in Taupo and it's on arguably slightly lower grade, grade, grade land, um, but it's incredibly effective and it has the benefits of economies of scale being a much larger site. This is also a model we're seeing rolled out a bit more now, uh, particularly on, on for farming groups who are more corporate and have large areas of land and sensitive catchments. So, between the three of these models, um, there's a little bit of something for everyone um, in terms of the farming model that's going to suit them best. And what we tend to do is we sit down with those farm groups and we look at their land and we say, and we, we figure out the model for them, we build through the financial models and give them a really clear sense of what that, um, what that economic model is going to look for them over, over the long term. I'll just, um, I'll just finish up by talking through the breed and then we can um, jump into a few of your questions in the space. I'm, I'm sure there'll be a few. So one of the real key challenges for New Zealand was not having was not having a breed of dairy sheep. When you look at the when I mentioned before that there's multi-billion dollar industries globally in sheep milking, the real um, defining factor when you look at them compared to New Zealand was they actually had very good dairy sheep. And New Zealand just hasn't had any. We had a very small, literally a handful of sheep imported in the 90s, but nowhere near enough in terms of um, scaling an industry from. And even them, even those sheep were uh, 20 or 30 years behind. Uh, where the rest of the um, global industries were. So we had a really good opportunity uh, working with MPI to um, import uh, the top dairy breeds globally to New Zealand. Uh, that was obviously a very uh, intensive series of protocols to bring those into New Zealand as you'd expect. Uh, but what it's meant is we've been able to tap into all the best breeding prog programs in the world. We've consolidated those on our farms in New Zealand. We've taken around, it's over 20 million data points uh, over the last five years assessing um, which exact genetic lines are going to perform in New Zealand and we've effectively created our own op open composite breed uh, which has matched the top genetics globally uh, to the New Zealand environment and particularly taking advantage of our of our pastoral environment here and that major pastoral advantage that uh, the New Zealand agri um, sector enjoys so much. So we're at this really interesting point now where as I mentioned this has gone, this um, program has been significantly more effective than we thought it could be. Uh, with our top sheep last year doing 550 litres. And when we look back on a few years, we're at 120 litres per sheep. So this has been an incredibly effective program and it's put uh, New Zealanders on a really competitive platform uh, to be a major player in the global sheep milking industry. Uh, we'll come back to the last piece, which is on um, on our next sort of uh, area of growth, uh, but I might just stop there to just take any questions on the on the farming elements. Oh, so I think you've already covered this question off. It was more around the financial value proposition for farmers 
converting to sheep milk production versus other options? Do you kind of, I think you, when you talked about the economics, you were pretty clear around the value of that, weren't you? Yeah, so just the takeaway from that is that um, at this point in time, uh, we're economically um, on the same par as a cow dairy um, op uh, option, uh, basically comparing against the sort of dairy based numbers um, in the Waikato. But we've got significant room for growth. We're at 250 odd litres now with the potential to go to um, over 400 litres. So there's really good room for growth in there in terms of um, creating an even more profitable model for farmers. And and would that would that conversion model? Um, do, do you want to just quickly talk us through like what that would look like if I was a cow farmer and I and I wanted to approach you? Like, absolutely. Do I get so we're, contract, all that sort of thing. Absolutely. Uh, so we're in the moment. Um, we've we're up to seven farms within the spring sheep group for this coming season. We'll be looking to expand that again for next season. Uh, the the model for onboarding is basically reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. Um, so if you drop us an email at the um, info at spring sheep email address, we'll come back to you. Uh, what we find is in terms of a pathway for those farmers is to have that initial discussion, give them a bit of um, a sense of what this industry is and the key bits they need to understand. We usually then like to take them around the farms, give them a real feel for what those farming models are. And then we actually sit down with them and we design a model that's going to work on their particular farm. Uh, at that point where you go into a contracting phase, at the moment uh, we have contracts that run on a, a three plus three year basis um, with a fixed milk price for the next three years. So there's a really good pathway for farmers. We'll look to, um, we're looking at what that long-term uh, structure is going to be, but at the moment we're on a, on a contracted basis. We're um, very lucky at the moment and spoiled for choice because there is a lot of interest and in what we're finding is generally it's those you know larger farmers that might have three or four in a group or those that are looking for succession planning and they're looking at putting one of their particular farms into sheep milk as an alternative way. So you know complementing their cow dairy options and it's a great position for us because we can really cherry pick the best farmers that are out there that complements their farms and our business. Exactly right. And Scotty's point there was we do want to work with the best farmers. We want to we want to work with farmers who, who are on the same page with us in terms of um, importance of animal welfare and quality and 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 really living and breathing um, that sort of spring sheep culture. Uh, and there's a lot of amazing New Zealand farmers out there. So we're, so we're very we're very spoiled to be in such a um a country full of so many capable farmers to um to work with. Yeah, we started off thinking we were playing with sheep and looking at sheep country, and now we're in the heart of the Waikato. It's the best dairy farmers that make the best sheep dairy farmers, and that's who we need to be working with as well to make this the best industry it can be. Yeah. Yep. And look, I think too, you know, as you said before, you're matching values, you're providing a level of blueprint. Um, what a fantastic way to diversify um, as well. <laughs> into something that people are still familiar with, but actually has um, a really good major growth perspective internationally for the future. Were there any other questions you wanted to, um, to run yep. through at this stage? There are quite a few. We've got interested in whether there is a wider industry opportunity growing up replacement stock for milking operations as opposed to winter lamb finishing programs. There absolutely is. Um, I just asked the, the person who's uh, put that question to get in touch with us directly. Uh, we we grow out a lot of um, a lot of lambs each year, and it's really important those are in the um, in the hands of capable farming groups. A lot of the um, a lot of the dairy operations uh, don't finish their lambs. They they send to other groups to do that. But there's definitely some opportunities in there. And as we grow as an industry, the um, the amount of uh, new young stock coming through is very high so we are looking we are already partnering with a few different groups who are supporting us on that journey as 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 spring sheep uh, but we're looking for other groups as well so I'd, I'd invite that um whoever that is to to get in touch with us and we can discuss that further awesome um and just to grow on that um I, you know i'm not sure if people realize but you you know you you carry everything through don't you even if it's at a slight cost just um all of your animals get taken forward to, so there's no waste yeah, well, I think there's a there's another layer layer to that one. Um, the the key one is uh, we often get the question, do you have a do you have a bobby calf issue? One of the one of the really good things about um, about sheep is that the the lamb itself is a fantastic um, New Zealand product. So economically, it actually makes sense to to keep everything that's on all of our farms. Uh, as an industry, we've also come together on this one. Uh, everyone in the industry uh, rears every single lamb born. Uh, which is absolutely fantastic. And what we're seeing more in terms of in the industry, and we're doing a lot of trials ourselves, is actually leaving uh, the lambs with the mothers. So the lambs actually stay with their mothers till they'd naturally um, move on to grass themselves. And then we milk um, after that point. And that's actually been incredibly effective. It's a system that's used um, globally a lot. 
and it's one we're trialling here in New Zealand as well. So um, there's a really cool story around how we treat our young in this model. And given that our consumers are typically mothers with young children themselves, I think that's a really cool and powerful thing. Awesome. Um, now, what is the protein percentage of sheep milk? So uh, sheep milk itself, um, the solids is, is incredibly high. So uh, we were around sort of 175 to 18% solids um, in the liquid milk, and about a third of that's protein. So we end up being about um, just over du around double um, cow milk protein in a liquid form. Okay, cool. And what is the trend sheep farming um, for sheep farming replacing cow farming? So I, I wouldn't probably use the word replace. Um, what I'd what I'd probably see it as is being an opportunity for farmers who aren't able to continue cow dairy farming. Um, this gives them another another avenue. So we actually complement, in my view, we complement cow dairy farming going forwards. We're just another opportunity for cow dairy farmers to keep using their fundamental skill set, to keep using their infrastructure, but to do so in a different way, in an innovative way, uh, that reduces the um, the nitrogen impact and creates different economic models for them. So we definitely don't see ourselves as taking farmers out of cow dairy. We're, we're working with them, really. Awesome. Complimentary. Hey, um, now this one is, what is Spring Sheep's forecast in 2020? And then it's got COVID question mark. Hmm. Um, COVID question mark. That was a really interesting one. So we were fortunate enough that other than logistically annoying for a month or two, it didn't really have any short term effect. Um, and then, you know, your governments in Asia coming out and say dairy is good for your immune system, so you should be consuming it. So we certainly had a spike in demand and um, all of our 2019 milk sold out earlier than we imagined it would. So that was fantastic. We cautiously optimistic as a high value food exporter or you know nutritional products it shouldn't affect our demand so we're quietly confident that COVID if anything will create more demand not less and um, while logistically it was challenging at the time it doesn't have any effect so things are pretty much on track for us on that one. Yeah there's there's very limited effect for us in our supply chain um, you know we MPI are fantastic in their comms to to us as you know to us in particular and, and the industry in general and we're able to keep everything running through the model in a safe way for our team. So um, I have to admit, I feel almost guiltily fortunate um, how good a position we're in. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, the New Zealand agricultural industry is going to be such a, um, a strong flag bearer for economic recovery in New Zealand. I think my personal view is I think New Zealanders will come out of this next phase being significantly more appreciative of how um, strong our prime industry is in terms of our um, in terms of its economic impact. So for us, um, it's a really good news story. We've had fantastic sales out of it. We've actually hired um, a whole lot of people over the last few weeks um, while we're in this really big growth phase. And look, New Zealand needs some really good stories um, in the next couple of years. And I think sheep milking is definitely going to be one of those. Absolutely. And I think it's awesome that you, um, you're always looking for improvement. You're always looking for the next opportunity to, to develop. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's one of those things that I think will create more success through that. So um, thanks for giving us a good story in New Zealand because we don't have we don't seem to have too many shared at the moment, and I think we need more of them. Um, now, are you focusing on volume rather than solids? Uh, so yeah, I mean fundamentally, solids is what we what we do focus on. Um, I, I'm just trying to understand the question as a, versus um, liters of milk, but no, we, we do think in a solids basis primarily because our products are, are mainly powder based. So we always come back to solids as being the main driver. Awesome. Um, and is Fonterra entering your market as a potential process partner? Um, the short answer is do not do not know. I, I would suggest that over the next 10 to 20 years, all the processes will be in it. Um, for the next three to four years, as Nick alluded to earlier, we've got D2 coming on board that gets us to the next two to three, or the next three years sorted, if not four. Then we're in the position whereby we can jump into any cow dairies processing and, and use one of their dryers. Who it will be, we just don't know yet. It's too early to tell. Yeah. And we're in the fortunate um, position that uh, within our region, there's I think around 16 different um, processes um, within within our milk catchment. So uh, I think for us, it's a matter of getting up to that next iteration of scale, and there'll be a natural sort of inflection point where we look at those business cases for working more more closely at a processing level with the existing cow dairy um, processing sites. Awesome. And here we've got what are the key markets for you, and what kind of export numbers are you looking at? 
Yeah, so we began in our first year and put everything into Taiwan. Um, that's a great little market for us. And the second year, we added in Malaysia and Vietnam, and they're ticking along well. Um, this year, we are doing New Zealand. We'll start cross-border e-commerce as well out of New Zealand, and then some into China. So basically five markets today being Malaysia, Vietnam, Taiwan, cross-border e-commerce out of New Zealand, and, and some into China. Um, what was the second part of that question? Sorry, Julia. Um, oh, it's just been... Even, uh, it's gone. <laughs> That's okay. They're, they're the markets. Um, and, and we don't need a lot more than that, to be honest. There's certainly enough there to get us through our next few years, well, many years of growth. So we're pretty confident with what we have between the big markets and a little bit of diversity. We're pretty happy around that. Oh, sorry. The second bit was actually about export numbers. So, you know, what, what I guess, what does success look like to you in the export numbers? Yeah, sure. So to us, it's about product mixes success. So every year we sell everything we produce. You know, it's that simple. We're, we're constrained by supply and um, the value comes in by getting, you know, more into infant formula as opposed to whole milk powder type products. And, and our mix is really, really important and getting our mix right between our own brand and what else we do. So that's a, you know, that's just a work in progress that'll be going on forever in that, in that one. Awesome. Um, now, here's here's a lovely one. It's um, Thanks, Nick and Scotty, for the really insightful presentation. Just in terms of the imported genetics, it sounds like there are there is a true competitive advantage here and a real barrier to entry for any new competitors. Who, in the case of the partner farms, especially, um, especially retains ownership? So uh, the genetics, uh, the ownership's retained by Spring Sheep. Um, and there's a very solid rationale for that, is we want to create a self-sustaining genetics program and Spring Sheep will continue to invest quite heavily in development of those genetics. So uh, in terms of our relation with the farmers, spring, uh, the farmers own the sheep, but Spring Sheep retain uh, the rights to the genetics so that we can make sure we maintain that sustainability. And that's also linked to um, one of the key themes Scotty started with was around making sure we have that supply demand dynamic right. And one of the best ways to do that is actually just to control the amount of supply uh, going to the market. And, and genetics is one of those potential levers where we can make sure that we have a sustainable um, balance between demand and supply. And it's a fantastic little lever for us on, on that one. A lot of us have come out of Zespri that set this business up. And I think you'll find there's a a strong correlation to plant variety rights, whereby by controlling supply, it's exactly what Nick said, we can control demand. And that's just a major part of the ongoing success of this business and being able to scale without crashing. Awesome. Um, are you planning to export finished products only, or are you looking at some bulk sheep milk to the likes of Danone? There'll always be a blend. I mean, you can't, we're dealing with our own animals through fresh milk, through the whole process. It's a very, very long supply chain and we'd always want outlets and safety valve so we'll always have a blend of our own brand which will be primary and the majority of what we do but we'll always work with some in bulk as well to be able to get rid of overs and unders and just ensure you know if you have an infant formula on the shelf you do not have the ability to out of stock so you must be very very clear on your volumes and what you're doing for your customers to do that we need to have other outlets to move overs and unders so we'll always do both i think it's just a prudent way to do business and there's always been a, um, in terms of how we set up our markets and channels and products, there's been this strong sense from, from us in terms of creating sustainability. Uh, we're very conscious that when the farmers um, convert over to sheep milking, they're making uh, you know, investments that, are, that have a decade or, or two decade um, mindset to them. So we've got to take that same approach when we set up markets. And that's why we've gone with a, um, a multi-market approach that incorporates our own branded product and some high value specialty ingredient alongside, because we just think that's the most sustainable way to do it. It genuinely would have been a lot easier for us um, to build this business and just go straight to ingredients to um, pick one market and um, one customer, but that's incredibly risky because you're um, fundamentally putting that risk back onto the farmers and their capital base. And so our view is it's been, it's been a harder journey and, a, and obviously a more expensive journey, but being multi-market, multi-channel, multi-partner, um, multi um, that's really what we believe is the most sustainable model for, for growing, this, growing this business over a long-term um, perspective. Awesome. So we're just going to go back to the farm. Do you herd test individual sheep production? Yes, we do. So um, we do. Uh, we have two or three sites that are significantly uh, more intensive in terms of the data points we take. So we've got uh, uh, in-shed milking, milk recording systems, um, which take a huge amount of data. Uh, on some of the other sites, we do herd testing uh, as well. Uh, we also link that up. We do a lot of um, DNA testing. So uh, we match up our data at a farm level to uh, the genetic piece. 
and we plug that all into um, some very expensive machines and and spit out our our ideal sort of breeding um, our breeding combinations to make sure that we're progressing the breed as quickly as possible in the areas that are important to us. So there's um, when I sort of mentioned we've had over 20 million data points, um, a lot of that has come from that farming piece and married up to genetic data as well. Awesome. Um, so back to the market. Um, how did you find your first market and did you come across any early bar barriers? <laughs> Great question. That's my world. So um, we put the ram out and so we knew we had five months to work out what we're going to do till the first milk came out. Nick and the team in New Zealand were flat out trying to build a shed and build a milking parlour and do all that and I jumped on the aeroplane to work out where we're going to sell this. Um, I I'd lived in Asia for 13 years before that and spent most of my working life up there but I, I wanted Taiwan or Korea. Worked out very quick, quickly that the tariffs in Korea wasn't going to make it work. Went to Taiwan, I think I was up to customer number 40. Um, 25 of them would take all our product and sign up for as many years as we wanted as long as it was 20 kilogram bags because that's what New Zealand does. Sell us the whole milk powder as an ingredient and we'll take over and run from there. That was just no's from me because we were here to set up a branded, ingre uh, branded business, not an ingredient business. Um, and then about four months after the ram went out, we um, came across a fantastic um, company in Taiwan that managed, we did really well with, and they aligned with us, they had the same strategic goals with us, and we set up and, and everything seemed like clockwork after that. It was over a million dollars of sales in our first year because that's how much milk we produced. So it was like everything, a lot of blood, sweat and tears, but we did it for the right reasons and um, it worked out well. Scotty, was it a little bit scary though? Um, like as you're saying, you know, we tend to produce stuff and get excited when someone wants to buy it, so we go with the first customer. Was it quite scary to kind of turn all those people down, knowing that you had to stick to a vision? Yeah, jumping on an aeroplane and coming home knowing you've turned down a sale is scary as hell when it's completely new and you've convinced a lot of people, firstly yourself and then those around you, that this is going to work. But I'd, I'd spent you know, a career offshore looking at New Zealand sell commodities and luckily I had five years working for Zespri in Japan and saw how it should be done as well. And I knew we could recreate that if we could just stick to our guns and hold it. And um, we got there, we just had to find the right partner. The, the first sale, the easiest sale is often not the right thing. If we'd done that, we would have made a lot of money in the short term selling whole milk powder and it would have worked for five, 10, maybe even 15 years and then it would have crashed and burned with oversupply. The way we've set it up with partners that understand brands and want it to be a brand going forward. We're setting up something that's got longevity and sustainability and we can create something that's going to be a long-term industry for New Zealand. Awesome, sustainable future. Hmm. Now, um, are you looking for a brand registration for a China infant formula brand? Yes, yes we are. Um, it's on the medium term horizons. It's one of the things we'll get. But if you look at other, you know, similar businesses to us out of Australia or New Zealand in the goat field or whatever, there's also a very large business to be had before you get to that stage. Um, there's many other markets you can sell to. There's cross-border e-commerce to get started anywhere, any, anyway. But in the medium term, that will be something that we'd, we'd like to get along the way. Cool. And, um, and back to the farm, can you help match land owner, um, owners and investors with share milkers? And if so, would, do you have a working model for this? Uh, we'd be happy to explore that. So, um, so get in touch with us because we do have um, we have different groups approaching us um, to get involved in the industry. Some just want to be uh, investors in the in the land itself, but don't actually want to run the operation. Some want to run operations, but uh, don't have the capital to invest. So, and, and everything in between. So, um, I just encourage you to reach out to us um, once you're on our radar and you understand the um, model. Uh, we can then look at whether there's some good alignment there. Cool. And um, this is kind of from me, but what's your, you know, what's your digital focus? So how are you, because I, you know, I know that you're so committed to connecting the production with the consumer, but it's sort of is digital part of that. Absolutely. And we're in the fortunate position where we don't have legacy systems and legacy businesses in place. So as we launch in New Zealand over the next two to three months, you'll see it's very, very heavy on a digital perspective, um, both here and in our markets. It's just going to get bigger and bigger. And that actually suits us because it levels out the playing field. So we don't have those bricks and mortar long term relationships. And when you go straight to digital, that doesn't matter. So it's something that really, really will help us going forward. Um, it's a new world. We're learning it. We have a different team to, you know, what was sales and marketing five years ago or even two years ago is not what it is today. But it's something that helps little companies like ours really get on a level playing field with the larger, more established businesses. And we just have such a cool story to tell in here. So mm -hmm. um, we just we're spending a lot of time with our farmers just to say, hey, look, just show us your world. Um, so send us photos, send us videos of your days and, and what's going on because the modern consumer is just so interested in there and then where their food comes from. And New Zealand just has such an amazing provenance story to tell. 
and it's a very genuine one and that's actually quite unique uh, I spent a little bit of time in the States and I um, I you know I looked at a thing of milk and it had a picture of days of the cow standing outside on the bottle and then I actually went to one of the farms that supplies it and the cows were just in these big rows with barely any breathing space or anything and so it wasn't a real story it wasn't a real narrative and I think that's something that um, New Zealand can celebrate so much is that we're real like our sheep are real and they're standing out there breathing beautiful air drinking beautiful water eating beautiful grass and that's just something we'd love to celebrate and the, the modern uh, platforms the digital platforms are just such a great way to tell those stories so that's something we'll really be focusing on over the next couple of years awesome and um, I've just got another question popped in why is your full cream milk powder not recommended for children under four uh, so that under four you should be having infant formula so we have a solution for that one um, so we'll be launching that later later in the year um, so it, basically the very young children um, have a different sort of nutritional requirement and, and there's some pretty um, clear regs around that one so uh, under that age group uh, we'll be looking at using you would be looking at using the infant formula or um, follow-on formulas cool Hey, look, just to kind of, I guess, round it out, what, what, what are your key messages for New Zealand right now? You know, we've gone through COVID, everyone's kind of feeling, I guess, a bit flat. Um, you're a fantastic success story and um, you consistently make me smile with what you do, um, especially when I get to cuddle your shit. And, um, you know, what messages do you have for New Zealand right now with, with what you're doing here? For, for me, it's pretty simple, Julia. I mean, yeah, things are hard, but we're in the high value food business, high value nutrition. And where we're sitting right now, one with the New Zealand provenance and two with what we have for consumers, as long as our whole world is focused around providing a better product for our consumers, we're going to create something really interesting here at a, for really high value for New Zealand. We can't make this around, let's make land change, let's get more farms. That has to be an outcome of doing the right thing in the market. So by concentrating on providing what our consumers want and providing the products that they need, we're going to be able to backfill a really, really cool industry for New Zealand. But it has to be consumer focused. It has to come from that end, not just make it because we can. Nick, anything you'd like to add to that one from your side? Yeah, just a, just a slightly different perspective there. I mean, we're in, we're in pretty interesting times globally, um, but frankly for me, I wouldn't want to be in any other country in the world right now, and I wouldn't want to be working in any other industry. Uh, our primary industry is just so strong, and I think we're going to recognise that even more over the next few years. And so I guess, um, while there's a lot of doom and gloom in the media, um, I think we need to be celebrating a few things as well, uh, that we do have such a strong backbone to our economy. Um, there's still so many jobs in that space. There's actually a lot of jobs in the prime industries that aren't being filled, and you know we're looking to bring people in from overseas. Um, there's so many opportunities for people to get involved, even if you've never been on a farm in your life. Um, you can be trained, you can get into it. So there is a lot of opportunities. Um, I don't think New Zealand should be doom and gloom. The whole world's been disrupted, and we're the one little island um, where everything's clean and we've got opportunities to grow and innovate. So I think there's a huge amount of opportunity in here in New Zealand relative to the rest of the world. Oh, thank you. Hey, look, now one other question has come in. Um, Alternative plant-based milks, so they're growing fast. Do you see sheep milk competing with this trend? Do your last protective. <laughs> well, this so, is our favourite. So there's, there's a couple of others there. I mean, in terms of speed of growth, interesting enough, um, sheep milk and uh, that alternative uh, dairy is growing a lot faster than plant milk. Um, so a lot of the a lot of the businesses are growing about 60% annually. Uh, we're definitely in that camp um, or more. Uh, and then as an entire category globally, being a multi-billion dollar industry, it's still growing just under 20% per year across the whole world. So there's massive growth opportunities in this space. Uh, in terms of plant-based um, milks, I don't have anything fundamentally against um, that industry, but I still think there's a really big opportunity here for um, full noise nutrition products that have it all in there, um, have, a, have an environmentally conscious business model, have an ethically conscious business model, there's still just so much demand in that space. So I don't necessarily see um, plant-based milks as being something when the, as a as an end of the world competitor for us. It's just a different consumer trend. And there's a lot of themes of that trend that actually apply um, apply really well to what we're trying to do with Spring Sheep as well, in terms of health, connect to, connection to food, uh, connection to the uh, environmental impact of, of the food that we're eating. So there's a lot of really solid themes there that the sheep milk industry can leverage and New Zealand can leverage as well. Awesome. Look, I'm going to wrap it up there just because I feel like we've taken lots of your time. Um, I've actually had a few people text through and say how amazing you are. And um, we've had some really positive comments. I would encourage anyone that wants to know more to contact you. 
I um, know how incredibly approachable you all are. Um, I have self-adopted myself to your Springsheet family on several occasions. Um, and, you know, when you've got open days, I would encourage people to, to register for them, use the information email box and just learn more and more and more. And if you can get near a farm, do get near one. They are sensational. And um, I, I just can't thank you guys enough really for being so good with innovation and creating this really cool um, environment that we can grow ecosystems around for being so good for New Zealand and, and actually just kind of showing us that there's some really good stuff happening out there. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Cheers. Have a good day. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers.